Well, good morning for this first Sunday of 2021. I want to talk about who is king of your life. Who is king of your life? And to do this, I want us to turn to a passage that we probably heard or read during Christmas, but it actually takes place after the birth of Jesus. And that's the story of the wise men found in Matthew chapter 2. Now, this story takes place as much as two years after Jesus was born. And Lord willing, we'll eventually get to that in the text and, and you'll see that. Um, but just as the star guided the wise men to the Christ child, so their story guides us to the Christ child. And it guides us to some principles, some questions we can ask ourselves that help reveal whether Jesus is really king of our life or not. It's the beginning of the year. It's a great time to reflect before the Lord and ask him to search our hearts, to show us if we truly are surrendered to the lordship, the kingship of Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 2, and the questions I'm going to give you today, they're they are all going to end with the word that begins with the letter T, okay? And the first one is this. Are you willing to give Jesus travel? Are you willing to give Jesus travel? Chapter 2 and verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. Now let's stop and talk about this. Uh, Herod was a wicked, wretched man. He was paranoid about maintaining his power. Let me give you some stuff from the life of Herod. Herod killed his wife, his mother-in-law, and his three older sons. Okay, He was paranoid about hanging out of power. Augustus said, it is better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. And a very interesting connection to this story is, is this. Herod had several fortresses built along his territory's eastern borders due to fear of what Persia might do. Okay? And all of a sudden, here come the wise men, the magi from the east. Are you getting this? What it must have been like whenever they arrived? What kind of commotion this would have caused? Now, these wise men, or your Bible may, may say magi, they, this office seems to date back to the time of Daniel and Esther. I'll give you some references if you want to write them down and look them up later. Uh, Daniel 2, 2, uh, 248, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, chapter 5, verse 11, Esther 1, 13, all mention the, the, the Magi, okay? Uh, Daniel was actually appointed leader over them, according to Daniel 2, 48 and 5, 11. And so it may have been due to Daniel's influence that these men knew to be looking for this star. They seem to be referencing Numbers 24, 17. It was actually a prophecy of Balaam, of all things. Amazing how God can use anyone. And it's perhaps because of Daniel's influence that they even knew about this prophecy. There's a principle there. That if we are faithful in the generation where God has placed us, if we're faithful to do the work that he has put in front of us to do, it can impact future generations. Daniel was faithful. The, the point we're on right now, are you willing to give Jesus travel? Daniel did some traveling that wasn't really of his choice, right? Whenever he was imprisoned, but it was God's plan for his life. And he made the best of it and served the Lord where the Lord had him and look at the impact all these generations later. Notice it says, they have come to worship him. Now, we only worship God, right? So this is one of those verses, the clear reference to the deity of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God. When we say he's the Son of God, please don't misunderstand that. He's the Son of God. He's God the Son, the doctrine of the Trinity. There's one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus is God the Son. So they've come to worship him. Now, this idea of traveling here, if they, uh, Michael J. Wilkins in the Zonor and Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary says this, that if the Magi had come from the environs of Babylon, they would have traveled approximately 900 miles. And back then, that was a big deal, all right? That was a big deal. Some people, God calls to travel this way. Uh, some of you hearing this. Maybe God has called you as a missionary and you're in another country or another state 
than your own. God called you there. For some of you, God may call you to go on a short-term missionary trip to share him. Uh, maybe to some place like Mexico or Honduras, wherever. God may call you as, on a short-term ministry. Some of you, God may just be simply calling across town to share the gospel with someone or across the street to share the gospel with someone. But are you willing to travel to go wherever God wants you to go? Maybe it's traveling to share the gospel. Maybe it's traveling because maybe you're looking to go to college and and God is calling you to a certain school, and maybe it's a bit of a distance. Are you willing to travel wherever God wants you to go? Well, the second thing we see here is this. Are you willing to give Jesus time? Are you willing to give Jesus time? Because this trip would have taken a while. Um, it's estimated that it would have taken them several months to make this trip. We're going to see later, it seems that May have been two years from the time that Jesus was born to the time they arrived. Perhaps some of that time was just making the preparations for them to be able to make this trip. Who's going to, uh, I mean, having things covered back home while they're gone or whatever they had to do to make this trip. Perhaps they're giving Jesus the new king time to his family to get settled in. But here they go, and it's going to take a bit of time to travel, and they're willing to give it to Jesus. Are you willing to give Jesus time? Time in the Word, time in prayer, time in serving with Him. Listen, time in the Word, um, we've done this before, but I think it bears doing again. Let me have you just turn to the book of Galatians for a second. I want you to see something in your own Bible. Uh, in my Bible, if I count the pages in Galatians, it's one, two, three, four, five. If I count the pages in Ephesians, it's one, two, three, four, five. Five. If I count Philippians, it's one, two, three, and part of a fourth page. If I go to Colossians, one, two, three, and part of a fourth page, just barely part of a fourth page. Uh, and you can go on through the New Testament that way. I mean, you get to books like Second John and Third John, it's less than a page. If you get to something longer like Hebrews, it's maybe 13 pages. Revelation is 21 to 23 pages, somewhere there. My point is this. If we can take time to watch a drama, which is an hour, or time to watch a sitcom, which is 30 minutes, then think about how much we could get read in the Bible in that amount of time, the time that we could spend with the Lord, what we could be learning from Him and about Him, if we would spend that kind of time. When it comes to prayer, if we can spend time calling our friends and family and texting them and messaging them, then we should be able to take time one-on-one -on -one with our Creator to talk to Him. Um, time serving with the Lord. It takes time to serve people, to help people. But that's, again, time surrendered to Jesus, time spent with Him. Are you willing to give Jesus time? Well, we'll look at the next thing. And that's this. Are you willing to give Jesus time? Your title. Are you willing to give Jesus your title? Look at verse 3 and following. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod's troubled, Jerusalem's troubled. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod summoned the wise men, then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Now, does he mean that? No. No, obviously not. But let's back up here. As we work through this passage, when it talks about the chief priests and the scribes who are able to quote this scripture about where Jesus was going to be born, there's a bit of a foreshadowing that's happening here as Jesus is a child, because whenever he grows up and is an adult, it's going to be the chief priests and the scribes that get together to see him crucified. 
And it's interesting because these guys, um, they were different. The chief priests were mostly Sadducees who do not believe in a future bodily resurrection. The old joke goes, therefore, they are sad, you see. And that's how you can remember. Uh, the scribes were mostly Pharisees who do believe in a future bodily resurrection. And so here we see these guys are on different pages, but they unite as enemies of Jesus later when they're, he's going to be crucified. And there's kind of a, a foreshadowing here of showing where their heart motivation is really at. Because listen, if they were really looking forward to the coming of Messiah, and then these guys show up in the single, and we've seen his star. And they're like, oh, you have? We, didn't, we, we missed that. But you did? Okay. Well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. If they had been sincere, they would have beat the wise man that, getting there, right? Or at least gone with them. But they, they don't. They know to quote Micah 5 too. But they don't live out Micah 5 2 as far as going after him. And so it's a tragedy that Jesus' enemies are united. We as believers need to be united. If we agree on the fundamentals of the faith, we need to be united in praising our God and in proclaiming our God. Um, now, it's interesting too here that the Magi didn't know the Micah 5-2 passage about Bethlehem. They knew the passage about the star from Numbers, but they didn't know the Micah 5-2 passage. But there's an interesting principle even out of that, and it's this. Follow what you know, seek to know more, and God will enlighten you. Follow what you know, seek to know more, and God will enlighten you. Let me have you turn to a couple of passages that talk about this kind of principle. Um, Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, look at verses 14 to 16. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he's been talking about sanctification of this living out the spiritual resurrection. Um, letting the, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In other words, live what you know to be true, and God will guide you into what you need to know. Um, look over at 2 Timothy 2.7. 2 Timothy 2.7 says this. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And these are verses for believers, that God guides us as we follow what we know. He lets us know even more. Um, but even for those, uh, if you turn back to the book of John, we won't look at uh, John chapter 6, verse 44 to 46. is one passage we can look at, but let me just say what that is um, as you turn to John 7. That one is about that if a, if a person was truly seeking God at that time, if they been they already believed in God, they've been looking forward to the coming of Messiah, that God was going to make sure they understood that Jesus was the Messiah. But look at chapter 7 of John in verse 17. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. I love that verse. That if a person wants to know if Jesus, that they really want to know God, God's going to make sure they understand that Jesus is the way to know him. So there's this principle here of, seeking uh, to be faithful to what you know and live that out and God uh, reveals what you need to know. But there's also a warning here to beware of imposters. Beware of imposters. We're all for Christians working together in unity, okay? Christians who are true believers and they're doctrinally grounded in the fundamentals of the faith. There may be um, some things we have disagreements on, but the fundamentals we agree on, we should be united but we are warned of imposters like Herod, this man that does not want to give up his title. He does not want to give it up. People like the scribes um, and the, uh, excuse me, the high priests and the scribes here, they don't want to give up their control. And we're warned about people like this. In fact, uh, turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15 says this. 
Paul writes, and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, watch this, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. And here we see Herod, who doesn't want to let go of his title, and he's seeking to disguise himself as a worshiper of the Lord, and he's not. Well, let me quote, in discussing this idea of, are you willing to give Jesus your title? Again, I'll share a Michael Card quote with you. You are not your gift. You are not your gift. Um, whatever it is that you do for a living, the way that you serve, that's not who you are. It's an expression of who you are, but it's not who you are. Who are you in your heart? Uh, your job or your title, those are just ways that you express what is in your heart. But you are not your gift. And so we must be willing to surrender our title or our gift to the Lord. There are times that God calls a person to serve in a certain capacity, and then he calls them to live to serve in another capacity. Uh, you may serve out of one area of giftedness, primarily, and then another time in your life, serve out of another area of giftedness. We must always be sensitive to the leading of the Lord in these things and ready to surrender. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 8. There's a warning for those who want to hang on to power like Herod is so focused on doing. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. And he called the crowd to him with his disciples. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Listen, there are people even in ministry that are afraid of losing their title. And so they won't say everything the Bible says. They try to stay away from the tough things, the things that culture frowns on. And they're more concerned with the, the smile of culture, of people, of mankind, than the approval of the Lord. And we want to make sure that we are surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus, that we will proclaim who he is and, and what his words are, even if it means losing some title before man. Okay? The next thing is this. Are you willing to give Jesus your treasure? Are you willing to give Jesus your treasure? Look at verse 9, back in Matthew 2. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So, to break this down, the star goes before them. Now, does that strike you as weird? The star goes before them. Um, how does that work? Well, there are several different theories. One is that this star is a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of God. It's kind of like Exodus uh, thirteen twenty one, where it talks about the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. Uh, another explanation is that uh, the star is a reference to angels. If you turn to the book of um, Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 20, uh, angels are referenced as, as stars. It says, um, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So some people think maybe the reference to the star here is a reference to an, an angel that guided them. Or 
it could just be a unique size changing moving miraculous star because god is god and he can do whatever he wants to do if he wants to shrink a star and move it he can and then have it go back and get big he can do whatever the star is not the point the point is the one the star led them to jesus the light of the world the star is there to just put a spotlight on jesus the light of the world and so they come to him and they offer him their treasures first of all they offer him spiritual treasure it says they fell down and worshiped him and again, we only worship God. And this points to Jesus' deity. And can you imagine this sight? Whenever Joseph and Mary, a Jewish couple, welcome Gentile men into their house. And these Gentile men in a Jewish home worship a Jewish baby. Who happens to be God incarnate. God in flesh. What a sight. They offer him their spiritual treasures, and so must, must we must give God our worship. We also, they offered him physical treasure. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Are we willing to give God our physical treasures? Notice, uh, let me just tell you about these and what the early church fathers said about these gifts, because they understood there was some uh, literary intent here with the gifts. They're actual gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but God is such a great storyteller that, again, there's there's foreshadowing of what's going on here. Um, gold pointed to Jesus' kingship, all right? It pointed to his, his deity. Early church fathers understood this to represent his deity. Frankincense was part of um, the only incense that was allowed to be used on the altar in the temple. Exodus 30, verse 9, 34 to 38. And the early church fathers understood this to represent his purity. Myrrh is used in Exodus 30, 22 to 33 to anoint uh, priests and priestly things. It's referred to as a stimulant in Mark 15, 23. It's used by Nicodemus at Jesus' burial in John 19, 39. It's meant to cover the decaying uh, smell of the, the smell of the decaying corpse and the early church fathers understood this to be symbolic of jesus death so if we take all these things and put them together here's what we get jesus is god he is the king priest who will sacrifice himself for our sin he is our substitute because he is pure because he is sinless he could be our substitute our sacrifice on the cross. Um, these things were a costly offering from the wise men. In fact, this may have been how Joseph was able to fund the trip into Egypt, which comes right after this. Uh, God's timing, God's provision, God provides for what he calls us to do. So let me ask, who or what do you treasure the most? Are you willing to give whatever you treasure the most? Are you willing to give it to the Lord? Whoever you treasure the most, are you willing to give them to the Lord? We've studied before uh, the example of Hannah giving her child to the Lord for his service. Whatever it is we speak of treasure, are you willing to give it to the Lord? Number five, are you willing to give Jesus your trajectory? Are you willing to give Jesus your trajectory? When I say trajectory... I mean the course of your life. What are your plans? Are your plans surrendered like, God, here's my life, whatever you want? Or are you trying to make that story happen by yourself? Because look what happens back in Matthew chapter 2, look at verse 12. Speaking of the wise men, it says this, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I call my son. Then Herod when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed 
all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were, watch this, two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Are you willing to give Jesus the trajectory of your life? Herod was not. He tells the wise men, yeah, yeah, go and bring back, I'm, you know, I'm going to worship him. He's faking. He's faking. The wise men, they listen. Their plan was to go back to Herod, and God warns them. Uh, listen, if a man tells you something and God tells you something, trust God, not the man, right? So they listen to God, and they get out of Dodge. They go a different way. And Joseph has this dream. And, I mean, think about if you're Joseph. You're, you're, he's a carpenter. He's a hard worker. All of a sudden, you've been given these gifts, um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh for, for Jesus, and they're expensive. And you think, well, maybe you're getting some money saved up in the bank, and all of a sudden, God says, you got to go. you got to go right now. And his plans just got changed. And they have to leave wherever it is they're living. They have to li leave their family connections, their friends. The money they thought they had saved up is all of a sudden going to be spent, at least some of it, um, on this trip down to, to Egypt, um, living there, getting down there, living there. What, what must that have looked like? But he obeys. He doesn't fight the Lord. He doesn't say, but Lord, I'm Joseph. You've entrusted the Messiah to me. Life is supposed to be easy for me. No. He's serving the Lord. And oftentimes as we read the scriptures, those who serve the Lord go through very difficult things, but God sustains them through it. And he submits the trajectory of his life to the Lord. And do you see what happens? The wise men and Joseph, they submit to God. And their obedience brings God God glory and it's for their good. I mean, we read the Bible and they're heroes of the story. Herod seeks to hang on again to his title. He wants to hang on to the trajectory of his life, make his own plans. He's not going to submit to, to God. Does it do him any good? No. No. He dies. What's it like to be Herod? I mean, to have, think about the grace of God. The grace that God showed this man by sending the wise men to him. I mean, hello, Mr. Herod, let me tell you that the Messiah has been born. And yet he rejects it. He rejects Jesus. He tries to stop Jesus, and he can't. He can't. You can't, you can't stop the Lord. He is almighty and sovereign. And he dies. What about the trajectory of your life? Will you let God write your story? He gets the glory, and it's for your good. He knows what he's doing. I'm thinking of that Ephesians passage that uh, we, we quote so often from Ephesians 2. That we're his workmanship, that there are good works prepared beforehand for us to walk in. So let's submit our lives to the trajectory of the Lord. Let him pin the story of our lives. Let's be willing to go wherever he tells us to go, to do whatever he tells us to do, to use the resources he's entrusted us with however he tells us to do so. So as we enter 2021, who is the king of your life? Is it Jesus? Are you willing to give Jesus travel? Are you willing to give Jesus time? Are you willing to give Jesus your title? Are you willing to give Jesus your treasure, spiritual treasure and physical treasure, and are you willing to give Jesus your trajectory? Listen, the king, he is all sovereign and powerful. He is all knowing and wise. 
and he writes our stories out of his goodness and love. So may we submit to him.